Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. Welcome to what I hope will be the first in a series of conversations online, perhaps in person, about the war on Ukraine, its aftermath and its consequences. What we aren't going to do today is tell you what will happen. Only a fool or a madman predicts outcomes in the middle of the storm. But this war will eventually end. At that point, when lives start being rebuilt, institutions are, are and, and arrangements are made anew, uh, the world will change. And that's where a Telberg conversation can be very important. We can be sure that the status quo ante is not coming back. What could happen? What do we want to happen when this is over? Today's conversation is going to be more about questions than answers, I suspect. My own questions start with some of the following. Why did Russia choose war? Why did China support that choice? Will the newfound unity in NATO in the West last very long? Will sanctions break Russia? Will the drive to net zero emissions be another casualty of battle? Will soaring commodity prices and food prices, disrupted supply chains, push Europe into an economic crisis, and maybe the rest of the world? Could the war spread beyond Ukraine? Obviously, there's more questions than answers, and we're going to do our best to at least imagine some answers. But we do have three thought leaders with us today who can get us going. Dalia Bankowsk is a Lithuanian strategic communications expert. She focuses on full society resilience. Jan Eliasson is a longtime Swedish and global diplomat, former UN Deputy Secretary General. Pierre Lelouch is also a longtime, we're all getting old, is also a longtime French parliamentarian, uh, government minister, deeply involved in, uh, in NATO, in security affairs, in, in, in nuclear issues. I, I'd like to start with the original sin. Why did President Putin choose to go to war? This is a war of choice. Pierre? What do you think? Because he, he did not change his mind from the very beginning, which is that, first of all, he does not accept the end of the Russian Empire from day one. He continuously repeated that for him, the demise of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century for his country. So he has never accepted the demise of the Soviet Union. He has strenuously worked to reinforce his country and recover its power. He's never accepted to be treated, as Obama once said, as a regional power. Uh, my old friend John McCain used to call Russia a huge gas station disguised as a country. That's the kind of stuff that he doesn't like. Um, and he has kept pushing for the enlargement of the empire as long as he felt there is no resistance on the other side, he pushes. And he pushes in Europe, he pushes in the Middle East, he pushes in Africa. Um, clearly, he has felt that after a number of major progress he has made, and for him, Crimea was a progress eight years ago. Syria was progress. And by the way, he entered Syria after Obama refused to, uh, to, to, to uh, respect his own red line on the chemical weapons issue. So he, he, after, after Obama's decision, he went into Ukraine and then back into Syria. Um, and this time he felt that after the incredible collapse of the, so the United States in Afghanistan, with the division and the weakness of the Biden administration, the incredible weakness in Europe. I remember we were on the verge of opening 
Nord Stream 2 pipeline. He thought that this was the time to do a game changer in Europe. So he came with his ultimatum on the 15th of December. He presented the United States and NATO with two pieces of document to be signed quickly in which A, Ukraine was to become neutralized and NATO would stop any, any further enlargement to the East, therefore um, uh, consolidating the glacier that he wants around Russia. And the second thing, he wanted the withdrawal of US forces and missiles in uh, uh, a NATO countries, especially in Poland and Romania. Um, he offered a negotiation on this. The Americans refused to uh, concede on the, uh, on the question of NATO enlargement and on the principle of the open door. Uh, I, I am one that believed that there, were, there was a missed opportunity there to have some kind of a negotiation on arms control and the status of Ukraine. In my view, Putin has never changed his mind. That's why, in my view, he will go to the very end of the operation in Ukraine, as ugly as it is. He told the French pre president exactly that a couple of days ago. He said, I'm going to go to the end of the plan. So no change. So as long as nobody stops him, he will continue to push. And uh, the question is, what do we do? One final sentence. I hear a lot of debate today on the notion that he's crazy, that he's a monster, he's wild, he's crazy. Uh, it's not as simple as that. If he's doing what he, he's doing, is because he analyzed that we are weak and he can get to his objective. I think he made a number of miscalculations in this operation and we'll go back to the miscalculation, but fundamentally his objective is the same. Each time he feels there is an opening, he will go and he will go to the end of it. Now, let me add by way of question dimension, people as disparate as Lord Robertson, former Secretary General of NATO on the one hand and Applebaum on the other hand, add to what you said, Pierre, and this would be a question to Dahlia, um, that, and I quote Robertson, his real and well, his, Putin's, real and well-justified fear is of democracy. And that what he really fears is to be surrounded by democratic countries because that might indeed undermine his and authority, his, his, his regime in Russia. Uh, Dahlia, you're sitting in a democracy on his border. Um, do you feel contagious? Hello. First of all, thank you uh, for having me on this panel. Yes, uh, we are. I'm. I'm. I'm talking from Vilnius, from Lithuania, and uh, we have a millennium-old relationship with uh, with Russia, just being neighbors. And unfortunately, that does not give us a lot of ground to trust our neighbor, especially in the recent. Uh, in the current times, um, I think I was listening to 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 Pierre' description, a very very fair, very precise. The only thing is that we we in the West, in democratic world, we try to to explain Putin behavior in a logical, rational way, the way we perceive. And uh, it's very difficult, really, to see how he perceives this world. Definitely, the the visions do not correspond. In a very short way, yes, correct. Putin wants uh, the world order according to his terms. And uh, he was uh, saying that so, so many times uh, and uh, promising by sending letters, writing articles or delivering speeches or conditions. And, uh, and as Lavrov repeated that uh, uh, Russia or Putin's army will continue the war against uh, Ukraine uh, till the very end. So, uh, so that's it. So I think uh, we should not, um, I don't know whether it's worth uh, wasting much time. I, I'm using this word, wasting time of really trying to, to understand uh, the way he's thinking as he's now in the psychological status as such. 
First of all, I think we have to to talk about the state. Is it is Russia that is run by by Putin as it is managed? Is it really a state, or it is a, just a group of interest? Because in principle, there are no there is no ideological confrontation. No longer there's no communist world and there's no uh, democratic world. There are democracy and there are and there are capitalism of both sides. In Russia, there's capitalism, unfortunately, on, only by those two percent. Uh, of population having all the wealth and the rest of population working very hard to to keep them rich, including Putin, and uh, and in the democracy world there's a respect to ownership and the and uh, and capitalism uh, guarantees uh, guarantees the well be welfare of uh, of the state. So uh, so what uh, we have to analyze uh, Putin and his group as really a group of uh, of criminals as a mafia pattern. I don't criticize. I'm not label him. I'm more trying if really to see we have to study the criminal pattern of behavior when you have a group. Jan, um, whatever Putin wants, he at the least wants a buffer zone. Uh, that is, he's said it explicitly. I, we had a neutral Austria in 1955. He wants a neutral at least Georgia and Ukraine in 2022, um, perhaps other places as well. Is that kind of world order, even forget the world order, European order, something that is possible, desirable, negotiable? Well, pragmatically, uh, I will just say that uh, there has to be some process to end the war and uh, the war must end. The question is how? and how long it will take for the war to end. Right now, uh, it's reason we have great reasons to be pessimistic because uh, Putin uh, has set such ambitious goals as he demonstrated in December, uh, which cannot be met. And of course, uh, the reason why country like, countries like Sweden and Finland react is that uh, he is introducing seriously the old idea of spheres of interest and Russia abroad and Russia near abroad and so forth, you know, concepts that become very dangerous. I'm sitting right now here at this moment on an island in the Baltic Sea, 200 miles from uh, Kaliningrad and two hours flight from Ukraine. So uh, we feel these cold, cold winds. Uh, I I think we, we should understand that this has this feeling on Putin's side has probably accumulated over the years. I remember talking to Russian foreign ministers back in the 90s and even early 2000 about uh, them joining European Union, even, <laughs> even NATO, believe it or not. Yes, I was there in conversations with foreign ministers, very serious people who were uh, sketching on this. And, and uh, since then we have had a downhill downhill road uh, and uh, descent with uh, your Georgia and Ukraine. And, and of course, from the Russian side, you know, they, they have a sort of revanchist attitude that uh, we didn't listen to them on the NATO expansion. They didn't, we didn't listen to Putin's speech 2007 in Munich and so forth. And now he has a chance to go for it. He has a chance to go for it. He, 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 he sees uh, that he has modernized the uh, armed forces of uh, uh, Russia, Syria, very serious improvement. He has seen the, it work in Syria uh, and possibly Georgia also. And Nagorno-Karabakh, they moved in there with forces to stop the, the, uh, the fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So he feels that he has the equipment and he also has a good economy, has the biggest uh, currency report reserves in the world, relatively speaking. He has oil prices going up to $100 a barrel. And he sees uh, US having gone through this uh, circus of Trump for four years, leaving the world scene. And he has also seen Biden starting in the same spirit with the uh, horrible pictures and images from Afghanistan going all over the world, not only, you know, recreating a Saigon 1975, but also questions about the, uh, the durability and the, the, uh, the sustainability of U.S. commitments. So he goes for that moment. Well, the, the, the only forces that now could possibly uh, start to restrain him 
uh, would be, I think, China would have a, a role to play. Uh, it's interesting that they abstained on the vote in the Security Council. Uh, they have many friends in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who voted among the 141 nations who rejected the, uh, the invasion uh, only two days ago in New York. Uh, there's also, I, I don't underestimate uh, the role that still must be played, although many are very critical of that, but I think Macron as chair of the European Union has a responsibility to speak out. And uh, I think it's important that we don't consider uh, diplomacy as a sort of a, uh, Chamberlain uh, concessions policy. You know, the, the, it's, we have to start talking. We have to have channels. And I can imagine some off-ramp solutions, off-ramp people that could play a role. We, we, we must not give up diplomacy in spite of the dark situation right now. There's several things, Jan, that you just mentioned, and one was the C word, that is to say China. Um, you did not mention that Mr. Putin attended the Olympics, um, and and it is hard to imagine, put aside leaked intelligence, that they didn't discuss this, that there wasn't approval given, uh, that there weren't commitments made um, by the Chinese to support uh, the Russian economy in the face of what we had widely advertised was going to be massive sanctions. And we've seen the purchases begin to accelerate of food, of, of energy, money's flowing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, first point. And the second point is the revanchist idea of spheres of influence is very alive in Asia. The Chinese have made it quite clear. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental pillar of their foreign policy, I think, that Asia for the Asians, which really means Asia for the Chinese. And, and that's been a drive they've been underway for some time. So. One could make the case that it's not just the Russians, it is the Russians and the Chinese uh, who are thinking, to Dahlia's point, somewhat differently about the world than maybe we have been thinking in North America and in, um, and in Europe. Pierre, where do you see the Chinese in this? Well, first, before I touch you said Chinese, I, I want to go back to the origin of, of this. We are as much as Putin responsible for this mess because of our own complacency with the change of, you know, the events have changed massively over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. And we have simply not adjusted to the reality. We believe that the Cold War ended on 8 December, 1991, when the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarusia decided to create three republic and that was the end of the Soviet Union. Not one single shot was fired. And for once it seemed that an empire would collapse without violence. Putin today is recreating the end of the Cold War or re rather restarting a new Cold War in a very violent fashion because we haven't prepared to this reality of the world today, including Russia, China and now the others. Uh, to your point, there are lots of revisionist, revanchist countries now in the world, in Turkey, in Iran, uh, in the Middle East, but also, of course, uh, China and Russia. The Chinese are going to watch very closely what happened with uh, Putin's war. Uh, they, they are ha very happy to see Russia suffering. At the end of the day, their partnership will be with a, a, a very um, weaker partner, and they want a weak Russia. Um, at the same time, they are also interested to prove that you can regain territory, because they have in mind to retake uh, Taiwan at one point or another. So if we don't do anything, and we won't do anything, because there is a risk of a nuclear war, uh, then the situation will be quite mature for them to take uh, Taiwan at any way, any time they, they choose to take it. So for China, I would say it's all benefit. If uh, Putin is in trouble, it's good for them. If Putin wins, it's good for them also. So it's fine for them. They just have to sit there and watch and continue to expand their influence. But fundamentally, we need to address, because we have been so complacent, in the last 30 years, uh, 
We don't understand that we are the ones that are responsible for the behavior of these countries. We let them have the cake and eat it at all this. Do you know that at the very moment that we are speaking, we continue to buy gas and oil from Russia every day? Every day we pump something like $700 million uh, in Russia because Germany, Italy need the gas and the oil. So on the one hand, we say that we are going to help the Ukrainian and deliver weapon. On the other, we continue business as usual on energy. And you know why we continue business as usual on energy? Because we have taken every wrong decision on the energy front over the last 20, 25 years. We, we slaughtered nuclear programs. We uh, uh, augmented the dependence on Russia. And at the same time, we also embarked on a very expensive, ambitious uh, green transition policy, which, as a matter of fact, only augments our uh, dependency on Russia. So we've done things all in reverse. We have disarmed militarily. We have increased our dependence on our dependence on Russia. We have increased our dependence on China. And then we complain if they behave like big powers, 19th century style. They just use their advantage. We are giving them everything on a silver platter. Now, the question is, after this is over, we will, have, will we have the generation of new leaders in the West that are look at this reality and are, are going to prepare our countries to face a decade or more of serious problem with this nation because we are in for very serious problems. Don't believe that it will stop with Ukraine. China will want Taiwan. Other countries will want to settle accounts because what is being demonstrated today is that yes, you can go and take your neighbor militarily and no one will move. Unless it is stopped, Pierre, unless it is stopped. Uh, because absolutely right, China. China is really playing, playing its own uh, its own game, and I strongly believe that they are interested in a, in a, a long term relations with uh, with uh, European Union with Europe because it's a rich market. So far, we are wealthy consumers uh, and a good, attractive market. On the other hand, it's quite uh, they are quite happy that now the focus is less on them rather than on uh, on uh, uh, in Europe on the war in Europe. So I think also how how we the West Europe handle the 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 war the invasion aggression this brutal aggression against Ukraine it's actually that will be the uh, the tone setting for uh, China dealing with Taiwan the response here will be the pattern in uh, in relationship with Taiwan another thing that the response thus far has been we will not fight we will sanction we will try to squeeze economically and we're not even clear how that's going to work. As Pierre just said, we're not really squeezing everything. We're squeezing something. Let me push it further. And, and it does go to my question of will this, could this war spread? Is this war stoppable through sanctions? No. 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 The war it's is only stoppable by getting ourselves involved in the fight. And there is a danger we do get involved in the fight by this notion that we can deliver weapons to Ukraine, which Madame von der Leyen made popular the other day by inventing for herself a new role as a weapon deliverer, where she has no competence in the subject. It's a very important thing. Please, Putin has said, don't interfere with my operation. If NATO interferes with this operation by delivering weapons, or more, and if there is miscalculation, we're into a war. And if there is a war, there is going to be nuclear escalation in Europe. It's a fact. He will go to the end of it, and we know it. Now, the question is, when I hear people play with nuclear things, and we had a couple of French ministers who were very imprudent in the last, last week uh, mentioning this. You know, the foreign minister, the economic minister talk about a total economic and financial war to Russia. What does it mean, total war? It means we change the regime in Moscow? Who, wants, who is going to do that? 
Are we ready for war with Russia and nuclear escalation? We are not. Therefore, we are not going to stop this war militarily, and we should stop being hypocritical and selling this to public opinion. I know I will be hated by what I'm saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm intervening here as somebody who is a strategist, who knows how NATO works, how we work, we know the escalation. I know the Russian military doctrine when it comes to use, to the first use of nuclear weapon on the battlefield. It's serious business. Now, if we are, if we are, you know, there, there are only three ways this crisis can end. One, Putin obtain what he wants, which is a total control of Ukraine. Let him stabilize. It will take years. It will ruin the country. Uh, it's number one. Number two, we uh, we we get uh, a war, and nobody we get involved into the war, and then it's a massive war. Number three, somebody kills Putin or, 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 or does a coup in Moscow. These are the three possible outcomes. No more. Now, Jan, I want to pull you into that conversation because you, on your resume, I don't know if it's actually on your resume, have extensive experience in trying to mediate things like Iran and Iraq, which certainly was a long, bitter, deadly, devastating war. It's too early to talk about, is, is there a fourth option to Pierre's three? Is there a, some, you, you already said, some kind of diplomatic path gives a fourth option, and if it's, you, you can't predict it, but, but what, what might it look like? What is missing from that equation? Well, I think we, we need to slow down things and, uh, and not enter a escalation of uh, threats and counter threats and, uh, and uh, the rhetoric taking over. I think we need to be very cool. Uh, of course, it's unacceptable that uh, Putin introduces the nuclear issue uh, into a situation where they are not in any military danger or even under any threat themselves and use the nuclear uh, dimension uh, to counter uh, political reactions. Uh, the sense among many nations, you saw it in New York, but you also see it in reaction from uh, countries like Sweden and Finland, is that uh, the war will end if we... Uh, no, the war will, of course, one day end. And what we can do to, to promote the, that movement is, of course, to make sure that we don't have a serious escalation. So I, I think uh, anything that can be done to, to slow down the escalation is, is crucial. Uh, I also think we, we need to bring in uh, elements of restraint uh, into the uh, situation. Uh, and the restraints for Putin will be uh, even if you don't see any signs that he is receptive to those signs. If China start to hesitate with their massive help on, on the effect of sanctions, uh, if you have, uh, if you analyze the vote in the UN with 141 nations against them, uh, after Putin's relative success in presenting himself as a cool operator uh, over many years in many countries, uh, if you see the sanctions biting, and I think, I always ask myself, well, I've been rather skeptical of sanctions, but in this case, if they really are serious about sanctions on the financial side, uh, it could have effects rather immediately on uh, Russian uh, public opinion, Russian uh, normal life. And there is, I know from many Russian friends, uh, a tremendous distaste of a war against a brother and a cousin nation like Ukraine, even if Putin tries to present it as a nation that doesn't exist. It's certainly historically part of the Russian culture and historically part of Soviet Union or Russia. So there are a number of factors that we need to strengthen. And in the end, since this unfortunately seems to be Putin's war, you have to look for uh, ways out, looking for those people who can talk to him, those nations that have a, a, an angle to move in his direction, an off-ramp, uh, an off-ramp opportunity. In the end, it will be probably about saving face since he has established such ambitious goals. But the thing is, the situation is so dangerous now that we cannot play with the idea of having a... Uh, NATO-Russia uh, confrontation in the middle of Europe. 
So we have to use all these other weapons since we, unfortunately, in my view, did not in Europe take care of our conventional defense. I don't think we should underestimate what the General Assembly vote says, because out of desperation that nothing comes out of the Security Council, you call in the member states and you see that 141 out of 192 are against this and ask Russia to withdraw from Ukraine. And then there are many other methods that bilaterally these countries can use. And I think we could mobilize that. And one country that is seeing this very clearly is China. China has been on a charm offensive with Africa, Asia, Latin America. These are their friends. I know from visitors to China that they say, well, we are ready to go for the road of multilateralism. If you leave peacekeeping operations, US, we will uh, support this and that program. Uh, Lack like supports this and that program. We will come in. So I, I think we need to look for openings everywhere right now and, and take the road to a slowing down rather than speeding up. Sorry, if I may, I think Jan is making the point a couple of times and he's absolutely right. We must absolutely keep the channel of negotiation open because at the end of all this, we will have to sit down with our neighbor and find a solution, including a solution to the status of Ukraine in the center of Europe between between us and, and the Russians. Uh, so, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad that President Macron has kept that channel open and, and stressed it publicly that we are not at war with Russia. We are trying to uh, make it very difficult for Putin to live with the consequences of his act. Uh, we have to understand that he... Pierre, Pierre but uh, if I can add to saying channel, open channel, uh, um, uh, there, are, there are channels... I, I was just going to say uh, on this negotiation thing, uh, I am convinced that nothing will work until, the, as Clausewitz used to say, the, the fog of war dissipate, which is that we see a situation on the ground which would then permit to build a solution. At the end of the day, we will have, again, to find a status for Ukraine, something that the Russian demanded in December on their terms, something the Americans didn't want to discuss and something we will have to discuss one way or another. We'll have to fix the situation on the borders in Europe. I would like to come back to Pierre's uh, starting of projecting those three scenarios because it's more, I think it's important to remember what happened, but more important to know where we are now and what can be done, at least consider options. So I wouldn't agree that uh, uh, Putin's Russia will stop with Ukraine. Uh, one thing, the first, uh, it will, uh, the war is in Europe and Europe finally, with some delay, but really woke up and realized that war is taking place in Europe and it will, it will, it really, it's, it's our fight. It's our fight about values, about structures and orders. So Putin will not be, you know, you won't be happy if NATO rolls back, Baltic states become without NATO presence, no NATO defense, etc. back to 97s, and uh, uh, Ukraine, as Ukraine, I don't know, no longer exists. That will not stop Putin. Another thing is that when talking about negotiation channels, always, always negotiations or dialogue channels exist, and they are really never, always exist. Moreover, uh, please remember that Kremlin is not only Putin. There are many groups of interest and influences, if I may use this word, and uh, among military as well. And negotiations even now are there. Do don't we know that? Not everyone is happy with this war or how these decisions are taking place. Uh, third, uh, about nuclear uh, nuclear conflict. If I follow this pattern, that that is the group, uh, uh, the the pattern that they don't think in the terms we think. So, uh, nuclear co conflict by using nuclear weapons not possible because because. Uh, uh, criminals are afraid of punishment. You know, if if they know that there's a response, they do not venture. Nuclear conflict 
is possible just because they are being as they are as brutal, they might attack civil objects like nuclear power station. Absolutely true. So, uh, so third and fourth, uh, information warfare. I really, uh, I really compliment uh, compliment uh, uh, the the bravery and uh, resilience and information warfare of Ukrainian people, as well as Ukrainian armed forces, is nothing short of a miracle. And uh, more, and at the same time, I have to realize that Russian society, reaching for to Russia society, is extremely difficult now. Uh, Putin's Russia ex- was extremely professional in creating in creating mobilization of the society at the same time isolating. Have you noticed? Have you tried to reach now your Russian contacts? You can't. There are algorithms that do not allow you to forward certain information, or actually they are physically afraid to because they are, as you know. And then and then moreover, they are using the vocabulary. Uh, like special operations. It's absolutely different perception mindset when you hear that uh, Russia is dealing with some special operations. They went, they rescued something, and they came back. There's no war. War is absolutely different concept. Why Europe woke up? Why Germany made a major changes? Why, why the European Union uh, decided unprecedented made an unprecedented decision of of supplying weapons and organizing all the logistics is just because uh, uh, is just because of uh, realizing that this is the war in Europe. Do you know leaders that sound like these? Leaders, young or old, who are changing the world, who are not content with what is and are willing to work for what could be. If so, nominate them for the Talberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize at talbergprize.org. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G prize.org. Because what I would like to do is go to the leadership word. This is Talberg's We've Got to Talk About Leadership. And there are several questions dealing with Zelensky's leadership on the one hand, good, bad, or ugly. And on the other hand, uh, Pierre, whether and why Macron is so far out in front of Joe Biden and the U.S., once again, in terms of leadership in confronting Russia. Is Macron the European leader who is going to, in fact, solve this? He's absolutely right. It's all about leadership. Um, Let me get to the situation first, understand where we are. Putin did what he did because, and he called it a military technical operation. He thought that this would be quick and easy, that he believed in his his own lie. He believed in his own vision that Ukraine does not exist. So he thought that this would be quick and easy. He made four big mistakes. Mistake on the Ukrainian army, which is stronger than he thought, on the Ukrainian people, on the Ukrainian leader, who turned out to be a master in communication, and he made a mistake on Europe. Now, why is Europe changing course so brutally? Tell you what, because of this machine, mobile phone, every Ukrainian has become a war reporter, sharing the misery of his life with the rest of the world, especially the rest of Europeans who believe like Dahlia that they could be in the same situation tomorrow. And that in turn has forced governments who were prepared to do absolutely nothing until the very last moment to suddenly decide to open their eyes on reality and yes, discover that all of our armies were cut by two or by three in the last 20 years, 30 years. The French army had been cut by half. We lost uh, uh, um, uh, 70% of our tanks, 60% of our airplanes, and so on. And I, and, and I could go on the list. Uh, we have 200 tanks left when the Russians have 16,000. Uh, this, this situ- and, and we have the, one of the strongest armies in Europe, believe it or not. The German army is, is in despair. So now they're saying we are going to rearm. It's going to take 15 to 20 years to rearm. Uh, the, the same German government until two weeks ago, was pushing legislation in Brussels in the so-called taxonomy, which which would have made it impossible to finance 
military industries in Europe, believe it or not, the same way they wanted to make it impossible to finance nuclear power plants. This is a German uh, pressure plus the Dutch and all. All of these guys suddenly said, oh, my God, this is a new world. We have to build nuclear power. I mean, not the, the Germans are not saying this, but uh, the Brits are saying this. So, uh, the French are saying this. All of a sudden, we discover we need to change the energy policy. We need to change the military policy. We need to change immigration policy. And yes, we have to become powers again. Now, the good news is that my country, France, has been pushing for this since 1962. The Fouché plan and the original French-German treaty of the Elysee, which was, was signed originally in early 1963. We have always wanted to have a power Europe with an army, with a military industry. Nobody wanted to hear that. Nobody in Europe wanted to hear that. Now I'm hearing that everybody wants it. Great. I just want to see it happen. I'm old enough to know the bureaucracy in Brussels and how governments are. If there is public opinion pressure, we may get there, and that's great news. And then the second question is, uh, what happened next with NATO and to American guarantee and the links with the leadership of, uh, of uh, Macron versus Biden? I am completely surprised by the disappearance of the U.S. Uh, before, all the way until the Verkunde, uh, right before the invasion, the U.S. was saying, the Ukrainian, if they want to join NATO, fine, we will support them. The open door policy, all right? Then the war started, and then the American disappeared. Nothing was said. So in other words, we, 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 what, the, the, what the American did was to invent a, a, a complex of anti-deterrence. They kept saying, the war is coming, the war is coming, but I'm not going to take part in it. I'm moving my embassy, I'm moving, moving my people, I'm moving, but the war is coming. So how, what the hell do you do with a country which is supposed to be the leader of the West and the protector of Europe, who says, like the wolf, you know, in the, in the story for the children, the war is coming, the war is coming, and war is the war, but I won't take part in it, okay? And now we have this situation where Putin makes this huge mess calculation, is stuck in Ukraine for many weeks and, and years, because he, even if he controlled the country, he will have to pacify it for years, and it will be bloody and very expensive and very difficult. And we are supposed to stand there and wait for American leadership? Forget it. This guy Biden will be gone in two years, and maybe we'll see Trump again or some other crazy guy who said Article 5 does not exist. So yes, it's about time the Europeans get their act together, and decide they should defend this continent and change their energy policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and change their military policy. Yes, uh, as to American leadership, frankly, after what I've seen in the last years in the Middle East, uh, in Afghanistan, and now in this crisis, thank you very much. You keep it there and let us try to fix this on the European side. So Jan, do you think European leadership, which has been an oxymoron for some time, is now going to take this opportunity and do some of the things that Pierre just laid out. Not just in the heat of battle, not just while the, while the, the pundits are all writing frantically and reporting, but actually do the hard lifting to change policies, to get people in Europe uh, motivated, to make the democracies work, to defend themselves, as opposed to what's been going on, as Pierre said, for decades. I think it's hard to make a prediction, but I know what I want to see. Uh, I, I think there is a opportunity now to look at uh, Ukraine, Ukraine's fight right now, the uh, astonishment that they keep the war still on a scale where they are fighting uh, heroically and partly successfully uh, in the beginning at least. This might be a dissuasive factor uh, to expand the war. I mean, one of the biggest risks is this expanse to other sure. parts. And I think the fact that the way they have been fighting both on the ground and psychologically and in cyberspace and information war is uh, highly commendable. The other thing is that this should be seen as an opportunity. Uh, Europe should 
now do what they have started to do, unite around becoming a respectable uh, continent also with military resources. I, I welcome uh, Scholz's decision. We in Sweden and Finland are also going to expand our military uh, capacity. And I think also by that, the there is a chance now that we could see come back to a pretty strong German-French uh, cooperation. Uh, we, as smaller nations, don't mind that. We think that with a combination of French and German policy, we could become an entity that could uh, be, be also a global actor. We, we, we have failed to be a, a global actor for a long time. I also think that we could now see a chance to move to perhaps build bridges to Poland and even Hungary, because in this crisis where Poland have uh, behaved in, in, a, in a wonderful way with the refugees and, and organized the the refugee flow across the border in a compassionate and strong manner. I hope to all who come over the, ba the border, by the way, but still this opens up for beginning, be believe it or not, a common migration and asylum policy in Europe, which we have been struggling for for many years. So I, I would say, yes, there is a potential for European leadership. I wouldn't complain that much about Biden. He has his big headaches at home. He, <laughs> He's struggling, but my God, if you look at the alternative, uh, you know, look at the, the risks that we will have Trump coming back in two and a half years. For those who want Sweden and Finland to join NATO, that's to me the biggest deterrent to think <laughs> of, of a person who is against NATO and against the European Union. But I think this is an opportunity for us to, to really rise to the occasion. And the reason why basically I believe enormously much in this is that we are slowly becoming a minority, the democracies of the world. Right. We in Europe, if you look back to the creation of the European Union from the coal and steel union, which had less, less to do with coal and steel and more with peace in Europe, we have a chance now to really become a global actor and, and to stand up for uh, democracy. Look at if, if Trump comes back, uh, it's a very shade of gray of democracy that comes out under his leadership. So I think here we have an opportunity in spite of this horrible situation in which we find ourselves right now. But that's why we must not let this escalation occur and the poisoning of international climate and bringing in aspects uh, like nuclear weapons and so forth. It's just, it's just a, a bit of a defeat of, of uh, provocation that goes on. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, there is room for leadership. And I, I think Macron and Schultz are ready to move on that. And I think we other nations should uh, come in uh, with our voices. Uh, and by the way, on Ukraine, I, 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 I think it's important that we do not forget that the choice of, of foreign policy and security policy for Ukraine must be their own. If they come to the conclusion of a model for their future, uh, that builds on, on, on perhaps not joining NATO, if that is a decision, it must be their decision. If there is an imposed decision from a, a negotiation from above on the Ukrainian people, I think we make an historic mistake. But I think they are smart enough to come to a, a best, a, the best uh, type of... I, I, the, the, the thing is, what makes me really mad at this horror that we're watching is that this was possible before the 24th of February. Uh, Zelensky himself, at some point, was ready for a solution with a neutrality status that would guarantee the security and the borders of Ukraine. We were, we were working on this, combined with an arms control initiative to deal with nuclear weapons in Europe, because, as you know, all of the agreements in Europe are now dead in part because of the Russian, but also in part because of the Americans in the last 20 years. So yes, there was a possibility to do this. Unfortunately, uh, it was not taken. It was not taken because in the US, they kept saying, no, 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 the, the, the door is open. Uh, as you said yourself, uh, Jan, uh, the Ukrainians have to decide and so on, because they said, you know, Vive the porte ouverte, the door open, and then Zelensky asked for protection. He had no protection. He was sent home to fight uh, alone. So at the end of all this, we will have to sit down 
and work with the Ukrainian status of that country and restore its, its sovereignty. I hope it can still be done after this horror. And as to what we should do in Europe, uh, like Jan, I'm very hopeful that this wake-up call will be taken seriously by the next generation of leaders. Public opinion now has realized that we live in a in a very dangerous world. It's time to wake up. Now, how much suffering will our population accept? Because this is only the beginning now of the economic consequences of all this in terms of energy cost, job, inflation. These are, these are going to be very difficult times in Europe as well. So you need a very strong leadership to rebuild military defenses, energy policy, and a much stronger industrial and trade policy. We have to, all, to do all these things, uh, something we have never been able to do in the last 30 years. So it's a tall order. I want to be hopeful, but you know, I've, I've been in politics long enough. I've read, uh, Pierre, Pierre, about leadership. I've read somewhere that democracy does not yield leadership, does not groom leaders, groom policy, uh, politics administrators, managers. Just an idea, not uh, can't, uh, but that's uh, observing, and uh, we can observe that. Uh, currently, just look for leadership or start identifying. Um, I would give a chance for USA. There's a possibility for the USA to be back to Europe, really being active in uh, in the war against uh, against Ukraine, against our, uh, us, uh, uh, Western democracies, and really play a, a, a good role, a, a leading role or active role, because then they will secure, they will gain, regain at least certain credibility and gain the allies, partnerships in their interest in Asia. Then Europe can re be really a very reliable um, ally uh, again, I would say. So there's a chance. But let me just, as the American in the room at the moment, um, and I don't want to make an American perspective here, but I do not think there is a serious conversation in my country about regaining the leadership role that we all would like to see the U.S. play. I regret to say that I think Pierre and Jan are directionally right, that if there is going to be renewed leadership coming out of this, it's going to come from Europe for Europe. And that wake-up call, and it isn't just Trump, and it isn't just Obama. This is decades in the making. The pivot the famed pivot to Asia was really a pivot home. And that has been ongoing for some time. And, and I, my own forecast is, is to expect it to continue. But the one issue that I did raise at the top that has not been touched on as we're, as we're nearing sort of the end of our time, another 10, 15 minutes, is climate. Because in Pierre's long list of things that now need to be done, he said energy, he did not say climate. And I can easily imagine a case where net zero is now gone from the table. That in fact, as you rearm, um, as you lose energy sources from Asia, from from, from Russia, um, as you turn coal plants back on, um, as you desperately, frantically try to rebuild a nuclear option, which is going to take some building in, in both in France and in Germany, that we have a huge problem, and I'm wondering if moments after Glasgow, uh, net zero is finished. Am I being too pessimistic? Uh, does anybody care about emissions other than Mr. Kerry, who told us we should care more about emissions than Russians the other day? What do you think? The Green Deal is over, at least my bet. I'm not, I don't sound, the, but I think it will be postponed just because uh, gas uh, or nuclear and uh, coal mining, unfortunately, will be back just because of, uh, of the war in Europe. And uh, because of uh, of um, you know, of the outcomes of uh, of this war, so that's uh, that's then definitely the climate change. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it uh, will be as a as a, um, uh, it will be not will not top the agenda, political agenda. Unfortunately, well, climate change is certainly not over. Climate change will, in fact, continue to accelerate. The question is, how do we do all the things that need to be done? It's very sad that we, we just this conversation uh, has shown that the subjects of climate change, pandemics, poverty, 
uh, inequalities, um, human rights violations, all are there in the background and forgotten almost. I think we have to be able to whistle and walk at the same time. And we have to do think in terms of both and and I, not as either or. Uh, the reality is that uh, climate crisis is a security issue. Uh, we may now be right in the midst of discussing Ukraine, rightly so, because it's an urgent issue. It must not run out of control. But if we forget the road that we are started, uh, we started to enter about two or three, five, four years ago, that, sec that climate crisis is a security problem. If the priority in Europe now is to fix our relationship with our big neighbor and do it seriously, I agree completely with Dahlia. This Green Deal has to be revised deeply, not abandoned, because I'm, you know, I'm very concerned about all the consequences. But again, mixing what we do in Europe, and certainly in my country, which the, one of the cleanest in terms of gas emission in Europe, uh, mixing us with what the Chinese are doing is crazy. So I, I would hope that the Green Party in Germany, now educated by Mr. Putin, will probably rethink some of his uh, religious belief on nuclear power and on wind power. So it's, it's time that we sit down and revise this whole thing. I don't know how much courage and leadership there will be, but it is inescapable. I find it crazy that uh, Germany is driving more Russian gas, more coal, at a time where we are fighting um, uh, climate change. It's completely counterproductive. And it put us in a very, very dangerous uh, dependence vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. So yes, we have to revise it entirely, but not drop it, of course. The assumption behind uh, the whole Glasgow, the whole, the whole IPCC was that countries are going to have to collaborate aggressively to address this problem, the climate change. The pandemic was a perfect example of a failure of globalization, of globalism, um, the slow pace of moving on climate is probably another example. Is it imaginable in a world that we've just spent an hour talking about with war in Europe, uh, with questions of regime change or not regime change in Russia and elsewhere, of wondering about Chinese leadership and whether they are interested in solution, same solutions that you all, that we all are interested in, how, to Jan's point, can we go back to a world where SDGs are taken seriously, where climate is taken seriously, uh, where pandemic equity is, uh, where, where vaccine equity is taken seriously, or is that entire agenda now finished? And we're back in a world, whether you call it the Cold War, this is a very hot war, we're back in a confrontational framework that, as anyone listening to our conversation would say, is not going to be over in a days or a week. We're talking about a dramatic shift in how the world works. All right, one, one la we, you know, to, to, to follow up on what you just said, I believe that we're in for very dark times for at least a decade and perhaps more because the effect of this war and this situation will be to spread wars, not to control them. Um, one of the thing, one of the victim of this, as you know, is the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed Ukraine security in exchange for abandoning nuclear weapons. Now, if I'm sitting in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Korea, Japan, anywhere, the solution for me is not security guarantees, is to go for nuclear. So you're going to have a massive influx of nuclear proliferation. You're going to have temptation by many revisionist countries to fix their border by using unilaterally military force. So I see a whole string of new conflicts and a new wave in proliferation pressure in, in the world. And if that's right, I believe that uh, climate change, as urgent as it may be, will fall in second or third place uh, because the question will be survival in many regions of the world. And I can hardly see uh, that as a key issue in the next uh, uh, generation. The next generation will be focused on survival and wars and proliferation as a result of the mess that is that has reopened. You said it was a dark vision. It is a dark vision. Jan? 
Well, I try to brighten it up a little bit. I think we have no choice. We have to take the climate crisis seriously. Otherwise, we are, as uh, the saying goes, we are only reordering the uh, deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, this is there. I have seen climate crisis in Africa and Asia, and it's there now. It's it's death, it's destruction, it's migration flows in millions. You know, it's already there. So we have we cannot we cannot stop that tension. And one of the reasons why I'm so frustrated and angry about this war in Europe is that it takes away the attention. I was negotiating for four years the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN. I was helping Ban Ki Moon with the Paris Agreement and uh, with Fabius uh, for the Paris Agreement. And I, I've seen the progress on in the Security Council succeeding in getting climate crisis as seen as a security threat. Uh, which it is, which it so is. He, yeah, it is, but I, that's why I say that we, we, it, this war, of course, we must deal with it now, and we have done so in this discussion. But if we th start to think in terms of either or, we simply have to mobilize all the good forces. We have to bring out the best of humanity and bring it out there. And because I'm not it's saying it's true. either or. I'm not saying it's either or. I'm just saying that this war will will carry consequences that are going to be hugely negative. And knowing how you know how governments work, you know. Uh, you know, Jan, you know how they work. They, they work on the most urgent issue, and the most urgent issue will be a survival, economic and, and, and physical survival. Uh, even though, as you absolutely rightly say, uh, you go to the Sahel region or Norwegia, yes, uh, climate is uh, very urgent as well. But here, I'm telling you, I don't see how it will remain a priority. <laughs> to Dahlia. Thank you. Couldn't it be that uh, okay, um, uh, I think honestly, I think that uh, that it depends on what terms we end uh, we end uh, the war in Europe, and exactly because this is our this is our war, and um, it's the same as uh, it's about threat perception, and uh, do we share the same threat perceptions? If we really manage to share threat, climate change as a threat and share this perception, and our moral compass will be the same, so it's very doable. And then we can really be aware. But it's the same as with the security. The security and the threats of, of Russia as a state was uh, threats were perceived differently on the eastern flank and further to the west. It was more, more relative than... Uh, uh, than on the eastern flank. So, uh, so that's uh, it. Depends really. Let's. Uh, I fully agree with Jan. We have to. Let's really. Europe should do the most to to finish the war on our terms and really be very prepared to uh, to to support Ukraine for coming years. Because Pierre, <laughs> I agree. Unfortunately, but uh, the hard times ahead. Uh, really, <laughs> it's, uh, we don't want to have Europe not united to be split. Uh, uh, we don't want to have uh, uh, European Union just an agreement of economic interest and having different armies, different uh, concepts of defense, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so the, the terms of ending the war in Europe is in our hands, in European hands. Unfortunately, I agree with Pierre and, and Dahlia. The, we are headed to dark days, but leadership can bend the arc, and that's what we need now. So thank you very much, Jan, Pierre, Dahlia. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Alan. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. Mm -hmm.